Now we move on to this concept, precision versus accuracy. I know I'm inundating you with a lot of different concepts that I'm throwing at you, but trust me, they form this sort of fundamental foundational building block upon which we'll be able to build the rest of the semester. So we kind of have to get this stuff into our minds. What is the difference between precision versus accuracy? Well, in everyday speak, we sometimes use these two terms interchangeably, but in the world of science, these two terms actually have very different definitions. In a science world, precision is how close a series of measurements are to each other. The closer they are, the more precise they are. The precision of a measurement is not the same, in science at least, as its accuracy. Accuracy is how close a measurement is to reality. For example, I want you to pretend that you are an archer. This is a metaphor that's frequently used, and that you're shooting an arrow or a series of arrows at a bullseye. The bullseye represents the actual real measurement of something. Now, if you shoot a bunch of arrows and they all go over here really close to each other, then you would say that your measurement is precise, but it's not accurate. See, remember, accuracy is how close your measurements are to the real, actual, real-life measurement, which would be represented by the bullseye in the middle. So this archer would be precise because the archer is getting measurements that are really close to each other again and again and again, but not accurate because they're very far away from the center of the bullseye. In contrast, this is a situation where the archer is precise and accurate because all of the measurements are really close to each other and they're very close to the center, that is, the real-life value, whereas this is all over the place, both imprecise and inaccurate. In a real-life setting, then, if you had a scale and you took a certain amount of substance and weighed it multiple times on that scale, and each time the measurement weights were very close to each other, then you would say that you are very, very precise. Now, if you took that same substance and put it on another scale that was very, very standardized and reliable, and it turns out that the two measurements between the two scales were vastly different. You have the very good, reliable one and the other one. Even though you got multiple measurements that were very close to each other with the other one, because they're so vastly different from the real measurement on the good, reliable scale, we would say that your first measurements are precise because they're close together but they're inaccurate because they're very far away from a true measurement or something closer to a true measurement. <laughs> of course, this assumes that you have this perfect scale that is actually giving you true measurements and that the second scale isn't also an error, but that's sort of the theoretical thing that we're kind of trying to deal with. Anyway, the point is, this is the difference between precision and accuracy. If all of your measurements are very close to each other, but very far away from reality, very precise, inaccurate. If your measurements are both next to each other and next to reality, then you're both precise and accurate. And if you're all over the place, then you're neither. Good luck with that. With that said, I now welcome you to SI units. SI, of course, stands for this French term, Système International, which I'm saying with my Frenchiest accent that I can muster. So we scientists typically use and publish our findings in international units of measurement called SI for Système International units. Each physical quantity uses a different base as its SI units. Here's a list of all of the base units that we use in this SI system. For length, for instance, the SI unit or base unit for length is meter, abbreviated as a lowercase m. For time, it's seconds, abbreviated as s or sec. For temperature, it's kelvin and so on. Now, the last one I wanted to introduce you to is mass. This one's a little bit confusing because the base unit for SI units is kilogram, abbreviated as kg. Now, this one diverges from all of the other ones up here. You see, the base unit, again, for length is meter, not kilometer. For time, it's second, not kilosecond. For temperature, it's kelvin, not kilokelvin, and so forth. And yet, for mass, it's kilogram, not gram. A lot of people are confused by that because you'd think that the base unit for mass should be gram, not gram with a kilo prefix slapped at the start of it, but that's not the way it works. As it turns out, the SI system or committee decided that kilogram is the base unit for mass. I'm not exactly sure why, but I suspect that the reason is because a kilogram is about two pounds uh, using American pound units, so it's a lot larger and easier to deal with and imagine than a gram, which is you know, much smaller. I'm assuming that it's more from a practical standpoint than anything else. Nevertheless, those are the SI base units. Now slapped on top of all these are numerous prefixes that represent specific numbers. For example, if you have a terameter, that is the same thing as 10 to the 12th meters. That's 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, you know, 12 times meters. If you have a nanometer, that is 10 to the negative ninth meters, which is 0 0.000. There's a bunch of zeros and then a one with meters after it. So nanometer is very, very small. A terameter would be very, very large. Now for my USU students, I require you to memorize the units shown in these boxes. 
their names, their prefixes, their abbreviations, and their number values. You have to memorize a kilo as being 10 to the third. That's the same thing as 1,000. A milli is being 10 to the minus third, a micro is being 10 to the minus six, and a nano is being 10 to the negative ninth. Now, here's a shortcut trick that I use. I happen to have memorized that a nano is 10 to the negative nine because the word nano and the word nine both start with the letter N. Nine, 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 nano, nano, nano. So that's a kind of way that, a trick that I use. Kilo is not too difficult to imagine because we are accustomed that we don't use them very often in the United States. Other countries do. We are at least introduced or familiar with a kilometer or kilometer right? A kilometer is a thousand meters. So a meter is something you can picture. We've seen meter sticks. They're about three feet in length. So they're some, you know, length like this ish. And, you know, a kilometer is something close to a mile. It's not really a mile. I mean, a kilometer is, uh, I guess a mile is equal to 1.61 kilometers or something like that. But, you know, it's somewhere kind of in that ballpark. So you can picture a thousand of these being present in one kilometer. Ergo, one kilometer is 10 to the third meters. Does that make sense? Now, as an aside for my university students, as well as all of you who are listening, I also recommend or advise you that you should also memorize that one cubic centimeter is the same thing as one milliliter. And for any of you who are motorcycle fans, engine sizes, I guess, of motorcycles are frequently reported in cc's. You know, you have like a 1200 cc engine. What does cc stand for? It stands for cubic centimeter. Okay, so it's, this, it's what this is. One cubic centimeter is the same thing as a milliliter, which is a volume amount. So this is a good thing to memorize. I don't require my students to memorize it, but I would recommend it. It'll help make uh, your working out of calculations a lot faster and easier. <laughs> we end then with temperatures, Kelvin, Celsius, and Fahrenheit. As you may already know, Kelvin, Celsius, and Fahrenheit are three different scales for measuring temperature, shown clearly over here in this figure. For example, zero degrees Celsius is the freezing point of water which happens to line up with about 32 degrees Fahrenheit and 273 Kelvins. In contrast, the lowest theoretical Kelvin temperature is zero Kelvin, also called absolute zero, which corresponds to negative 273 degrees Celsius and negative 459 Fahrenheit. These are the equations for interconverting between Kelvins, Celsius, and Fahrenheit's. Okay, I guess degrees Fahrenheit and Celsius. Anyway, the point is, if you've got a Kelvin and you want to convert it to Celsius, you can use this. If you've got a Celsius and you want to convert it to Fahrenheit, you can use this or vice versa. So these equations, I will not require you to memorize. I, I honestly advise you to memorize the interchange between Celsius and Kelvin. The Celsius to Fahrenheit one, I will not require you to memorize, but I will give you, my university students, opportunities to use these equations that I will give you to be able to interconvert between these temperatures.